So today we are going to dive into one Gabriel Davis because Gabriel Davis has been a hot topic pretty much all offseason. Uh, a lot of patrons, a lot of folks on Twitter think that he is a prime buy low candidate. He is he is set to take off in 2021 and they are dead wrong. <laughs> He, he is not set to take off. He is set to crater in epic proportions. So let's talk about why that is. First off, I want to preface by saying Gabriel Davis is actually a really good prospect. Had he been drafted in round two, one or two, he'd have been a bulletproof prospect. He actually would have been. He was a good prospect. He's 6'2", 216 pounds. He's an alpha. He would have been a bulletproof alpha. The problem is he wasn't very good at football. And the NFL said, you know what? If you're not very good at football, we're not going to take you in round one or two. We're going to take you in round four. And that's probably where he belonged. He went up pick 4.22. It's not like he was a fringe fourth rounder. And when we compare to history, we have to remember that in the last few years, the comp picks have really pushed down how much further a fourth round pick is than in past years. In the early part of the 2000s. So when we're looking at Gabriel Davis, he was a good prospect until he fell until until he fell to round four on draft day. That was when the NFL said, actually, he's not a good prospect. Your model, your your process, your numbers, they are wrong. He is not good. So let's quickly just talk about his sophomore columns because I find this really interesting. When I look at my bulletproof prospects that go that last until day three or go undrafted, they they aren't good. This is regardless of how they performed as rookies. These are just bulletproof pre-draft grades that fell to round or to, that fell to day three. So we have Antonio Callaway, Farrell Cooper, Gabriel Davis, Dominic Hickson, Tajay Sharp, Rashard Higgins, Desmond Briscoe, Dante Ridgewood, Isaiah Hodgins, Isaiah Ford, Deontay Burnett, Greg Dortch, Willie Sneed. These are all of them. How many, how many, how many hits did you have on the list? How many of these guys did you want to buy after the sophomore year? Probably not very many. You should not have been buying these guys after their sophomore years. Just like you should not be buying Gabe Davis. But Gabe Davis played as a rookie, and when we do his sophomore comps, it comes up with some some players that are not very good at football so here are the ones that are drafted in round three that had similar performance to gabriel davis that includes his pff grade his points per game and his you know round three capital so we have julian edelman is the only hit he had five top 24 seasons one top five one top 12 julian edelman did not play wide receiver in college he was a quarterback convert so if you're saying that gabriel davis can hit because of julian edelman which you're probably not because you've never made this connection before. But if you were, you would be wrong because Julian Edelman did not have the same path at all. Julian Edelman is a 7th round pick because he's a quarterback convert. Totally different. Brian Hartline, there's your one example. He had a single top 24 season. He's the only one. Chris Givens, Jameson Crowder, Mike Thomas, Malcolm Mitchell, Austin Colley, Gabriel Davis, Johnny Knox, Denarius Moore, Darnell Mooney, Demar Demarcus Ayers. And then we got a whole bunch of undrafted free agents that, that we're not even going to go into because they are UDFAs. Like, they're clearly not good. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is that based on Gabriel Davis's path into the NFL, based on how he performed in college, it didn't matter. Based on how he performed in the NFL, it still doesn't matter. There is no proof of concept here that Austin or that uh, Gabriel Davis is going to be good in the NFL. There is nothing. We can't point to anyone other than maybe Brian Hartline. We can maybe point to Brian Hartline. He could be the guy. But anyway, beyond the normal metrics that I look at, there's some other ones that are truly horrendous for Gabriel Davis. If you go to playerprofiler.com and you look up his true catch rate, uh, first I looked up his catch rate and it was atrocious. It was like 56%. But I was like, yeah, you know what? Maybe he didn't have very good accuracy. Accurate passes. He wasn't receiving accurate passes, which was in fact the case. Josh Allen was not accurate when passing to Gabriel Davis. He had a very low catchable target rate. But his true catch rate, once you throw those out and you only look at the ones that he could have caught, it was still only 76.1%. Number 93 in the NFL. 93! The 93rd best catch rate, true catch rate in the NFL at wide receiver. That is that is not good. And then we have his, we have his contested catch rate, right? Like, he's an alpha. He's 6'2", 200. 10 pounds-ish, 26.3% contested catch rate, number 97 in the NFL. That ain't good. His yards per row run, 1.32, number 84 in the NFL. The only reason that we are talking about Gabriel Davis is because he happened to make some of his catches in the end zone. He had seven total touchdowns. That's a 19.4% touchdown rate. That is way, way out of line for anything that we should ever expect anyone to do. That is never going to happen again. So he was really, really inefficient when it came to, you know, accumulating yardage and outrageously efficient when it comes to touchdowns. And because we are fantasy football players, we see his points per game, which includes touchdowns and yards. And we say, oh, look at his rookie season. He's pretty good. But he wasn't pretty good. He was, in fact, really not good. And then from like a 
projection standpoint, I'm not going to dive way into the projections here because we don't even need to because we know that Gabriel Davis isn't good. So he's not going to just force his way into a whole bunch of targets. But if we were trying to make that con- make that happen, last year you only had 10.8% target share. That's that's fine for day three rookie. Like it's pretty good for a day three rookie. It's not as good as the guys that actually hit from the day three, from day three, but like for a generic day three rookie, that's not so bad. But here's the problem. They still have Stefan Diggs who had a 29.2% target share. They still have Cole Beasley who had a 19.9% target share. And they signed Emmanuel Sanders who last year had a 19% target share. So if you think that Gabriel Davis is pushing one of these guys out of the way, I would guess it's probably not going to happen. Maybe he can push Sanders out of the way because Sanders is, I don't know, 34 or something like that. But I wouldn't bet on it. I don't think you should bet on it. He's probably not taking Cole Beasley's sl- slots out, or snaps out of the slot. So Beasley's still going to get his 20%. Stefan Diggs is one of the best wide receivers in football. So he's still going to get his, you know, his share. So there, there, there just isn't like open, open targets available for Gabe Davis to fall into. He needs to earn them and he is not going to earn them because he's not good at football. What this all comes down to though, like these guys are fine to throw a dart on until you can get a quality player out of it. If you go to Keep Trade Cut, it's a website that puts together a trade calculator that tells you what you can trade these players for. Gabriel Davis's value is roughly the equivalent of a mid-2022 second. It is roughly the equivalent of a early 2023 second. These are picks I would easily take for Gabriel Davis. If I could get any second round pick for Gabriel Davis, I'm doing it. I'm doing it in a heartbeat. I'm not even... I'm not even considering whether or not I should. I'm already clicking accept. In fact, today, literally today, I made a trade for Gabriel Davis. I sent a 20 or I sent Gabriel Davis. I got in return a 2023 second round pick and $10 fab, like 10% of the fab. I like that. I don't know if you know this, but nobody is ever going to say no to your trade when you when you counter with some fab. You, you know, they send you an offer. They're like, I'll, I'll give you a second for Gabriel Davis. And you're like, nah, that's not quite enough. How about $10 fab? Nobody's saying no to that. Every single person is clicking accept because they wanted that trade in the first place and nobody values fab. Free agent acquisition budget for those that aren't familiar with fab. I'm talking about dollars to bid on free agents with, dollars to bid on waivers with. You need fab. At, the, at Bulletproof Fantasy Football, we are looking for every possible advantage to win championships. And like I said, nobody is shooting down that extra 10 fab. Last year on May 4th, 2020, this was, you know, days after the NFL draft, we told you to go and get Darnell Mooney on waivers. He was not getting drafted in your rookie draft. You could pick him up on waivers. You can now flip Darnell Mooney for a second round pick. Last year, we told you to go and get James Robinson in that same message on May 4th, 2020. This was well before Leonard Fournette got cut. This was well before Divine Ozigbo got hurt. This was well before Raquel Armstead contracted COVID. We said, go and get James Robinson. I hope you sold them because we told you to sell them too. But the point is you can get good players on waivers. Darius Slayton was another great example last year that you should have been trading for a second round pick because you got, you got not because you got him on waivers, because you could trade him for a second round pick and he probably wasn't going to pan out just like Gabriel Davis isn't. These are players that you need to get off your team. If you get that fab as a throw in, you can go and get more of these players. You're printing second round picks to help your team. And here is an interesting thing about the Bulletproof prospect process. When we are looking at comparing the process, so Bulletproof graded players, whether they're drafting the first round of rookie drafts, I'm talking dynasty rookie drafts, not the NFL draft, dynasty rookie drafts. So if they're drafting the first round, second round, third round, fourth round, it doesn't matter. The hit rate is consistent. What the other fantasy players think about a Bulletproof prospect is irrelevant. No matter which round we are looking at, the hit rate is the same. So if you're getting a second round pick and you can get, you can draft bulletproof players in the second round because you can almost every year in Superflex Leagues. And by the way, all of this I'm talking about is in Superflex Leagues. So in Superflex Leagues, if you can get a second round pick, you are drafting bulletproof players. I remember drafting DJ Moore in the second round in some of my leagues. Christian Kirk was a second round pick. That didn't work out, but it could. History would tell us that it doesn't matter that he was a second round rookie pick. We're getting, this year, we have a couple of players in the second round of rookie drafts right now that you can draft that have the same hit rate as the guys that go in the top five. It doesn't matter when they get drafted per ADP. What matters is their grade. So what I'm trying to tell you is a second round pick is not nothing. You want second round picks. We are drafting good players in the second round year after year after year. So if you have Gabriel Davis right now, you need to go out and trade him for a second round pick and some fab. Because Gabriel Davis himself was a waiver ad in your league. If you had extra fab, you definitely got Gabriel Davis to now flip for a second and more fab to get the next Gabriel Davis and so on and so forth into perpetuity. That's all I have to say about Gabriel Davis. 